Hey everyone, Taha Basi here. I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at Ferrum Network. And I just wanted to drop in. I know it's been a while since we put out any videos talking about our mainnet. So I want to drop in and just share some insights about what we're working on, why we're excited about it, and why should anyone care about Ferrum Network's mainnet and what it's doing for the world. So in this video, I'm going to go over uh, some analogies about what the importance of interoperability and standards of communication, standards of development are as it relates to the Web3 world, but I'm going to explain with some analogies um, from the real world. So why don't we get right into it? Let's think for a second about travel. Travel is something so important, and I know many of us enjoy when we get to go on vacation, uh, whether you're in America and you get to try to go on a trip to Europe, uh, whether you try to travel through Asia or South America or many of the other beautiful places around the world. Well, if you take uh, go back in time, let's say about 100, 150, 200 years, and you attempt to take a trip through Asia or Europe for that matter, taking a trip through Europe uh, in the early 1700s was a lot different than it would be today. For example, uh, at that point, uh, even today, you have different countries in Europe, such as Germany, uh, Netherlands, you've got um, uh, France, you've got all these different countries speaking different languages. And if you wanted to travel across these countries at that time, where English was not predominantly the language that is spoken as a communication, international communication languages across different countries, you would have to learn French, you would have to learn Dutch, you would have to learn German just to be able to go to a restaurant and order something or just to be able to go to um, even a train station or anything for that matter. For any form of communication, you would have to learn the native language of that country, which adds layers of friction as you go to travel to that country. Of course, you can go pick up a dictionary and learn those things, but the fact that today you can go to these countries and for the most part as a tourist you can communicate in English, it allows anyone, even if you're not a native English speaker, even if you're someone from China who speaks Mandarin, you can pick up English and you can use that as a communication language across all of Europe for the most part. If you go to South America today, it's slightly different. In South America, English is not predominantly spoken across different countries because they all can communicate amongst each other. All the countries predominantly speak Spanish or a version of it. So uh, they can communicate across in Spanish, hence there's no need for English. But yet again, they have a common communication channel across. So people who are from South America or Spanish-speaking individuals can travel across South America with ease without having to learn specific dialects or specific languages that are spoken in each individual province of, of South America. Now, this makes travel a lot easier today. This is the same thing. This, this same standard was applied on the Web2 side. So a few decades ago, uh, we had something that was introduced, uh, something known as RESTful APIs. And these RESTful APIs, and, and, and uh, among other standards, there's so many other standards that have been adopted by now, but this is just one example where you have a common structure of how you would communicate with servers, how you communicate across applications, and all developers bought into this concept and, and bought into the concept that standard ways of communication, standard responses, standard status codes allow us to develop faster without actually knowing exactly how the application we're communicating with is developed because we know that it will conform to a specific agreed upon defined standard. This made things like AWS possible. Now, many of you have heard of AWS, but many, many, many people I'm sure don't realize that when you watch an NFL game and you watch the Super Bowl or any other NFL game for that matter, and you're seeing those uh, lines come up that describe where the first down is when you're first and 10, first and five, first and two, so on and so forth, that all of those statistics, all of those things that you're seeing uh, being calculated on the screen, the player stats, the uh, different ratios, the even the streaming itself is powered by something like AWS. But AWS would not have been possible if there was no standard that was adopted overall by the development uh, sector. So the, the, the availability and the implementation and adoption of standards made uh, infrastructure solutions like AWS possible, which made it now the norm, the standard for NBA, NFL, even streaming platforms, cable companies even to this day rely on AWS or similar infrastructures through Azure or Google Cloud to broadcast and stream their information. How does this relate to Web3 and Ferrum? Well, Ferrum is doing. 
well, it's it's well known that in Web3 standards are out the wazoo and not really widely accepted. There have been some attempts with uh, Ethereum's introduction of uh, EIPs and, and the different uh, ERCs that they've introduced out, uh, specifically with the ERCs being different standards that would be implemented as to how EVM compatible networks would develop token contracts or non-fungible token contracts or smart contracts in general, how signing would be handled. And these are all uh, deployed in either the form of EIPs or ERCs and adopted not only by Ethereum, but every other EVM compatible network uh, has to conform to these, right? So whether it's BSC or Polygon or uh, Arbitrum or so on and so forth, they all have to conform to these standards if they want to be considered EVM compatible. These standards, however, don't cross the non-EVM side. In the non-EVM side, you have their own set of standards. So what you've got now is that same situation. You've got the France, Germany, Netherlands situation where France, the people in France are speaking French, Germans are speaking German, and in Netherlands, they're, they're speaking Dutch, right? So the problem here is how do you get them all to communicate with each other? Sure, they've got their standards to, to they've got the inter-country, the, uh, the inter-country grammar, uh, and the intra-country rules, but how do you help them communicate across different countries in the form of travel or in the form of Web3? How do you help these different chains and how do you help developers communicate across these different chains, develop applications and solutions that can communicate across these different chains? This is exactly where Firm never comes into play. So uh, an example will be Polkadot has deployed its XCM standard for cross-chain messaging, right? And this is a standard that has to be implemented by different chains. And some chains in the Polkadot ecosystem have already started to implement that within their own network. What Ferrum is doing is taking it to the next level where we are not only implementing and adopting the standard, we are also contributing to these standards so that other developers and other chains can benefit from it. For, for our our theory and our approach in this area is that the more developers, even if it's our competitors, adopt these standards, the better it will be for the Web3 industry. So not only are we contributing more to these standards, such as with an example of a multi-chain token standard that we are submitting, but we're also uh, adopting these standards and applying them across different networks, whether they are EVM compatible or not EVM compatible. It does not matter whether you're in the Dotsama ecosystem, whether you're in EVM compatible chain, whether you're in the Kosama, uh, uh, the Cosmos ecosystem, it does not matter. That is literally what Ferrum spends every day doing, is making these standards more interoperable. So we're bringing the standardization to the world of interoperability with the hope that it will make development a lot better, a lot faster, a lot more streamlined, and more exciting solutions can then be built out, such as infrastructure solutions that will make the mass adoption of Web3 possible. So that's just a little bit of a hint of what we are doing. That's a little bit of a hint of what the mainnet and our quantum portal infrastructure is going to be able to accomplish. Over the coming days and weeks, we're going to be putting out some more specific content, including some demos that will explain how these use cases have already been implemented in our version of the POC testnet. Uh, I'll be demonstrating how to run a node. I'll be demonstrating uh, our multi-chain token standard, uh, among other things. And I'm excited to share all those things with you. So if you are somebody who is already in the firm community and is interested in keeping up with the updates related to our interoperability layer about our mainnet and our general technology stack, I highly encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, give this video a like and share it. Uh, join our Discord if you haven't uh, for the latest updates. Uh, you can communicate directly with myself, with our developers and engineers as well. Um, and just stay tuned. We will be putting out a lot more content to share what Ferrum is up to and how we are out revolutionizing the world of Web3 every single day. Thank you and look forward to seeing you in the next video.